Welcome to the Cedar Creek Bible in a Year podcast. Whether you are listening on your own, with a friend, or a group of friends, we hope this podcast helps you connect with Scripture and also enriches your relationship with God. Here are your hosts, Luke Shortridge and Andy Rechtenwald. Welcome back, everybody. Cedar Creek Radio is on the air. Luke Shortridge hanging out with Andy Rechtenwald. Andy, how are you doing today? Great. How are you doing? I'm doing amazing. Awesome. So, Andy, question for you. Okay. Do you know any lawyers? Yeah. Tell me about them. Well, I know one. He serves at Vertical in Perrysburg. He's the oh. Wood County Prosecuting Attorney. Oh. His name is Paul Dobson. Awesome guy. Nice. Yeah. Uh, how many John Grisham books have you read? I think maybe I started one. Oh. Didn't finish it. Oh. I had better things to do. Sounds gripping. <laughs> <laughs> do you know I've read almost all his books? Are you kidding me? I love him. John Grisham? Yes. David Baldacci is a good writer, too. No, have never, you, you read no. his stuff? You have to. No. It's really good. Sorry. So it got me back into reading. I prefer authors who Action. can spin the, ling- the English language in a sophisticated yet powerful way. You are. I think full John of- Grisham's a good author. I really do. Yeah, I'm sure he is. I think David Balducci's a hack. But- Baldacci, first of all. Well, Second of all, have you even read his books? I don't need to. How read can you them. call him a hack? <laughs> I read the back of a couple of them. Sounded pretty cheesy. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty awesome, actually. Oh. You should re- I'll give you one when you leave. All right. Well, we're going to talk okay. about lawyers today. Okay. Uh, we are reading the book of Micah mm-hmm. and Nahum. Okay. And Micah kind of, he, he uses um, like a case, almost like God is presenting a sure. guilty verdict okay. to the nation of Israel. So almost like a lawyer, he presents a case against Israel. So I thought today that I would feature some lawyer jokes. Oh, um, do you know any lawyer jokes offhand? No, I I'm not good at telling jokes. Well, I, I, I have you. a I have a friend who is a lawyer. Uh, he's oh, a Dugan, defense attorney. Yep, Tim okay. Dugan. And uh, I, I said, Tim, do you know any lawyer jokes? So he sent me a couple. So um, you know, these are I, I don't know if they're lawyer approved, but I got them from a lawyer, so I think that makes it okay. <laughs> do you want me okay. to work through some of these here? Yeah, let's go. All right, uh, and I apologize for already the lawyers were going to offend by this. That's Just, fine. You got to know that going in. Yeah. Okay. What do you throw to a drowning lawyer? A lifesaver. His partner's from the law firm. <laughs> 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 These are very mean-spirited. I'm just telling you. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, what's the difference between a lawyer and an onion? I don't know. Do you know, Eric? Nobody cries when the lawyer gets cut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, and the way you cut an onion... Neither. Yeah, so I, exactly. I guess they'd be the same. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between a lawyer and God? I don't know. God doesn't think he's a lawyer. <laughs> 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 All right. Have if, if you heard about the lawyer who took a basketball and tied a rope snugly around it? He threw it at an incoming truck, the ball wrapped around the side mirror, and then pulled the lawyer's arm clean off. He didn't get in trouble, though. In fact, he sued the driver of the pickup truck. Do you know what he sued him for? No. Armed robbery. <laughs> that was pretty messed up. I, yeah. I think I heard that in junior high. Really? That one's been with me a long time. Interesting. Yeah. What's the difference between a catfish and a lawyer? Well, catfishes are bottom dwellers. Does that have anything to do with the joke? It does. <laughs> okay, go You're ahead. halfway there. All right. Uh, go ahead. Bottom feeder, maybe? Is that One the is a scum-sucking bottom dweller, and the other is a fish. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, these are terrible. Okay, Uh, how do you prevent a lawyer from drowning? You throw his partners from the law firm. You already said that one. (laughs) You don't even ask the question. (laughs) Uh, All right. I I got like two By the way, anybody that's a lawyer, like, we don't really think these. Okay. They've already drafted their lawsuits. Um, We're... We're going to be uh, copyright infringement or something very soon, I'm sure. It's like you guys are poking the bear here. Well, maybe. Uh, Perhaps. Why do they bury lawyers 12 feet down instead of the traditional 6 feet? I don't know. Because deep down, they're good people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> now, you're saying a lawyer gave you these jokes, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, he, well, yeah. Most of them he did. Yeah, but I think that, like, I think when you sign up to be a lawyer, not that there's a sign up sheet, you know, like sign up to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like when you're like, I'm going to be a lawyer, I, I think people, you know, warn you, hey, this comes with the territory. People are going to make fun of you. Oh, yeah. For, I mean, you yeah. don't study that hard and you don't go through all that you do in law school to not make fun of yourself a little right. bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Right, that's that's like telling a surgeon, like, oh, hey, you know, there's not going to be any blood or anything. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Like, I think yeah, that's part of the job. All a clean Yeah, the worst here. part of the lawyer jo- lawyer's job is getting jokes. All right. <laughs> so, Andy, a man walks into a bar and yells, all lawyers are jerks. And one man at the end of the bar stands up and says, hey, I take offense to that. So the man says, why, are you a lawyer? And he says, no, but I'm a jerk. <laughs> all right, this is the, the last one. Dugan sent me this. How many lawyer jokes are there out there? Good question. I don't know. None. They're all true. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That was good. Yeah. I I feel like we should apologize to lawyers. Yeah, we've we're been, sorry. We've been very hurtful. I mean, I really didn't do anything. I just sat here and listened. So. Oh, you were an accomplice. No, so, uh, I mean. I'm, I, I'm sure I we can he, find a crime to charge you with, Andy. You probably need to apologize. I'm. Sorry to lawyers. Sorry. <laughs> Moving on. Nope. All right. I take it back. Okay. Uh, Andy, let's let's get into some quick hitters of our books today. All right. Okay. So first off, uh, we're covering two books in this episode. So I think let's just take them one at a time. Sound good? Great. Sounds right. good to me. So let's find out about the book of Micah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Micah emphasized the need for justice and peace. And then like a lawyer, he set forth God's case against Israel and Judah, the leaders and the people of Israel as well. Yeah. And he, uh, Micah makes it clear that God found his people guilty of sin. So we're, remember we're talking about lawyers, judge and jury, that kind of stuff. God found his people guilty of sin, um, but he's also ready to forgive them for the sins for the ones that turned to him. Yep. And he wrote to warn the people of coming coming judgment and then also to offer pardon to all who repent. Um, You know, when you're reading through the Minor Prophets, there is a lot of repetitive nature to this. Um, You know, it's kind of a similar message over and over, but that was the prophet's job, to warn the people of sin um, and bad behavior when they were acting outside of God's plan for their life. Yeah, and uh, the author is Micah, who's a native of Morasheth, which is near Gath, not that anybody really knows what that means, which is about 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem, so that might help. Well, and we say that because that's about all we know of him. <laughs> we know the city he's from, and that's it. That's pretty much it. <laughs> right on. So written to the northern and southern kingdoms. This is during the period of the divided mm-hmm. kingdoms, so Israel had split. Uh, Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah and also Hosea, which is pretty cool. He knew those guys. Uh, and it really is a beautiful example of classical Hebrew poetry. Which yeah. That does set it apart a little bit. Definitely. So uh, chapters 1 through 2, we'll see the trial of the capitals, um, the, the capitals of the different nations. And then uh, yep. chapters 3 through 5, we'll see the trial of the leaders. And then finally, 6 through 7, we'll see trials of the people. Cool. All right. Well, let's move to Nahum. Nahum is known primarily as the other prophet to Nineveh, Gosh. which we you know featured in a previous yeah episode that being the jonah podcast Mm -hmm. of course if you haven't checked that out already you should do so definitely so it was written to declare god's forthcoming judgment upon the nation of assyria nineveh being the chief capital city Mm -hmm. of assyria yeah and and what sets this book apart is that it's actually only 47 verses and in those 47 verses he uses almost every literary form known to ancient writers (laughs) he uses metaphor simile synecdoche just learn how to pronounce that word well done woe satire dirge Various parallel structures, partial acrostic. An acrostic is like, where if I said like, Andy, awesome, new, D, dutiful, dutiful, and you're welcome. Uh, Alliteration and assonance, right? (laughs) You did well on that list. I was worried about it going in, but you nailed it, my friend. I did my research. Yeah, he, (laughs) Nahum is a heck of a writer in, say, very short, succinct book Mm -hmm. really he he uses as poetic a language as possible and uses all those tools that are available to him yeah and and he shows that god doesn't just sit in heaven that's part of the book that he doesn't just sit in there resting and thinking he's involved in every arena of history yep and we really don't know a lot about nahum like a lot of the minor prophets yeah i mean we we got a name we know he's a prophet of god good enough doesn't spend a lot of time on himself Mm -hmm. Um, unlike a book like Jonah, it's not a narrative. It doesn't tell his story. It right. just contains his message. Yeah, it's written between probably 663 B.C. and 612 B.C. And that's roughly 100 years after Jonah. So Jonah comes, if you, again, if you haven't heard this podcast, you got to listen to Jonah. Yeah. So Jonah comes, he gives his message, the people repent, mm-hmm. but now they've fallen back into their sinful ways. Yep. So God sends another prophet to tell them again what will happen if they don't turn from their ways. Yeah, and so this is kind of comforting to the nation of Judah because it 
told them that their enemies would be destroyed. Yeah. It, that, that's the worst kind of prophecy. Like, yeah. if you don't repent, you're going to be destroyed. Oh, and you're going to be destroyed because you're not going to repent. It's <laughs> crazy. That's a bad day right there. Yep. And as we mentioned in the um, the Judah, or sorry, not the Judah podcast, the Jonah podcast, the capital city um, of Assyria was known for its cruelty, its murder, um, idolatry, lies, treachery. They were the worst of the worst. Yep. And so he predicted that they, that they would eventually fall. And then historically, they actually did within 50 years of his prophecy. Yep. Babylon came and conquered Assyria. And, you know, I think it probably was very comforting to the nation of Judah that yeah. their chief enemy was going to be destroyed. Yep. Uh, but it, it didn't mean that the problems for the nation of Israel was going to be finished with that because Babylon would come in and they would capture Judah and oppress the people, kind of the same way that the Assyrians had done to the nation of Israel. Right. And uh, so, guys, every week we want to give you an opportunity to dive into the Bible with us. Uh, we can't cover every story in the ch- in the books we're talking about, not even close, um, but we'd recommend that you go back and read through the entire book so that way you can get a sense of what's going on and do your own research, especially. Um, we're going to be reading in the New Living Translation if you want to follow along. Um, if you're not driving, you can use your Bible app or um, a paper Bible. I think they still have those. Uh, we'll also be asking some questions as you uh, listen along. And if you're by yourself, feel free to journal out your questions. Or if you're in a group, just take some time, pause the podcast, and discuss with your friends. Cool. Yeah, both of these books that we're going to talk about today are short. You can mm-hmm. read them each in one sitting. Oh, yeah. And there's really some cool stuff in there. And I, I think both of these books are probably ones that most Christians haven't read or yeah. studied or looked at. Right. They're, they're worth your time checking out for sure. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Well, Andy, let's check out Micah 3, verses 9 through 11 Great. to kick things off here. Listen to me, you leaders of Israel. You hate justice and twist all that is right. You are building Jerusalem on a fountain of murder and corruption. You rulers make decisions based on bribes. You priests teach God's law only for a price. You prophets won't prophesy unless you are paid. Yet all of you claim to depend on the Lord. No harm can come to us, you say, for the Lord is here among us. Hmm. Ouch. So he's, <laughs> Yeah, he's warning the leaders they shouldn't accept bribes. Um, it seems like that there's some of that going on today. You know, like sometimes pastors... Bribes? Ex- yeah. Never. They'll accept big bribes when they let big contributors control the church. Hey, let me tell a quick story. Hold on. Yeah. We'll get into that too, but... Yeah. So I'm, I'm on a mission trip mm-hmm. in Mexico, and the cops pull over the host family that we're staying with. Yeah. So the cops... And here's what you have to know if you haven't been to Mexico. Almost everybody in local law enforcement is corrupt. <laughs> They don't get paid anything. The way that they make money is through bribes. Bribes. Sure. So they let the host family know unless they paid, it was about $100 US, they were going to impound their car, take them down to the police station, and they can hold them for no reason at all for like 24 hours. Yeah. So the host family we were with paid it, but they didn't want us as Americans to know they paid it. Sure. But what do you do? I mean, you're in a corrupt society where bribes are just the norm. That's what... That's how you operate and, right. you know, everything else. So they, they paid it and continued on. Man, sounds yeah. terrible. Yeah, and pulled for, for no reason. It's just totally random. You know, Like if you have a nice car, you will get pulled over more often because they think you have money. And they can just do whatever. Yeah. Man, that's crazy. Um, and it's a, it's a little bit different because that's a difficult situation. You know, bribes aren't, you know, necessarily the right thing to do. But how do you make that decision in that moment? Right, what, what do you do? Is my family going to go to jail or am I just right. going to pay them 100 bucks? Right. Uh, but then you look at, when we kind of mentioned earlier, that there's... Yeah, what, what do you mean by the church? There's there's some, you'll see, and, and I don't want to name any names or whatever, but it's it's common today where pastors or I guess big, big, big churches sometimes, and even sometimes small churches, they will let big contributors control decisions they make and what they teach about because they don't want to upset them and lose money. Totally agree. Which is a bribe. Yeah. Essentially, you know. Yeah. Oh, I don't disagree at it's all. It's like it's like politics, pretty much. You'll talk about what I want you to talk about. Um, I, you know, I've only I've only ever belonged at a couple of churches, yeah. but I, I know it, if anybody's ever been involved in church politics before, um, you usually in a church have a couple of big givers, yeah. and they are pulling the strings. Mm-hmm. They are the ones that, uh, you know, if they don't approve of a certain pastor or a leader, that person's days are numbered. Yeah. Um, they they hold a lot of weight in the church. Um, and I, I think that's really dangerous. It is. You know, it, as church leaders, um, and we run into this all the time, people are selfish by their nature. They yeah. want what's best for them, not mm-hmm. necessarily what's best for the kingdom of God right. or for, say, unchurched people, people who are on the outside who really need to be there. Yeah. 
Um, I, I remember when our church first began, um, this, this was like 19, 18 years ago, so I think I can tell this story now. Sure. Um, <laughs> the guy who invented Rogaine, had, he was a Christian, he was a Christ follower, mm-hmm. and he made it his life's work after this invention. He's a multimillionaire. He would travel the country and give donations to church plants, churches that were starting. Okay. So uh, our leaders met with him, and w- kind of what was on the table was a million dollars. Yeah. That he potentially was going to give a million dollars if he liked the proposal that he heard. Yeah. So um, I, I don't know exactly how it went. I, I've just heard the story after the fact, but... Um, kind of the money had strings attached. Sure. Um, they kind of figured out that if he was going to give this donation, he was going to be calling some of the shots of worship style, what staff would be hired, you know, some of the key decisions he wanted to have his influence in. And Lee Paul told him, no, thanks. Yeah. And they walked away. That's huge. Which is crazy. That's integrity. And I, I you know, at the time, we were struggling. Sure, get, yeah, um, they needed the money. They, we needed it bad. <laughs> I, I was part of the original core team, so yeah. I remember those early days when we thought, we don't know if this thing's going to work or not. Right. But I think God really blessed that decision by Lee to say, you know what? Um, if it's not a true gift, if it's more of a gift with strings attached, right. I don't want to say bribe, but, sure. um, you know, if it's a gift with conditions, then no thanks, we're going to walk away. And I think this is not us um, giving an indictment on all churches except for Cedar Creek. Of course not. But this this could be potentially commonplace if people, because the church has to have money to run, and so it can be very easy for pastors or leaders of the church to um, to be swayed one way or another by people that give a lot of money. And this is also not an indictment on people that give a lot of money to the church um, and want their opinions to be heard as well. Right. It's just something that all of us need to be aware Here, of. Here's what I would say, though. If you give money to the church and you designate of where that can be spent, mm-hmm. is it a free gift? That's weird. Because yeah. you're still putting conditions on it. You sure. can have this, but you have to use it in this certain way. And I, I know that might step on some toes, uh, but the truth is if it truly is a something you are releasing— yeah to God and saying, God, use this as you will. There shouldn't be any conditions on it. Yeah, I agree. Well, let's go to our first question then. Have you ever used your resources to influence or manipulate others? Have you ever allowed yourself to be manipulated for money? That's a very good question. Um, That's why I asked it. Yeah, I don't, (laughs) I honestly, um, I've never been a person with a lot of money enough to be able to influence people with it. Um, so probably not, I'm trying to think of if I've ever been influenced or manipulated, um, for money. Mm -hmm. And I've said when I used to work security, um, I've said yes to working shifts. I really didn't want to work because I I wanted more money, but I don't think that that's not manipulation. They would just say, Hey, it's going to be time and a half (laughs) and you need it. I know you need it. You're a college student. I was like, all right, I'll go in. But I don't think, I I think college is probably the most vulnerable time in your life. I I remember several times going to visit friends at college. I didn't even like that much because they're going to buy me lunch. (laughs) They're like, dude, I got 50 bucks in my food card left. I got to spend it by Wednesday. You go to the, you go, yep. And you go to like the little cafeterias where you don't want to be anyways, but it's free food. Yep. I hear you. What about you? Uh, I think I just mentioned it. Oh, that's what you mentioned. That's being manipulated. Are you in college, man? You you just you do what you got to do to get by. You, you just got to survive and get through it's it. The wild wild west out there in college. Well, world. it's no West Toledo, but it's something. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Uh, let's go to Micah five one through five a, the first part of five. You want to hit that, Andy? Sure. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephratha, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. The people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Then at last his fellow countrymen will return from exile to their own land, and he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Then his people will live there undisturbed, for he will be highly honored around the world, and he will be the source of peace." Very cool. I, I love this section. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the most blatant prophecies yep. of the Old Testament, um, which we, of course, as Christ followers believe was mm-hmm. specifically about Jesus. This is quoted later in the New Testament. Yeah. Um, so this prophecy is hundreds of years before Jesus' birth, and it probably was the key text that led the wise men to finding Jesus so awesome. after he was born, which yeah. is super cool. All right, here's a question. In what way has knowing Jesus given you peace? How can you replace the hurried pace of your life with the peace of God? Um, for me, 
it can be very easy to be right now I'm in school full time in a master's degree program and I'm also full time at the church and I also have a new baby. Um, and, and you're a full time husband. Yeah. So it can be very easy to get caught up in what's going on at work or in school. Um, and I, I know it was like a couple weeks ago where I, I sent, I thought a lot about how, how much time I was putting into making sure that my, my marriage was honoring God and I wasn't like kind of putting my wife to the side. And I realized that, um, I had not taken her on a date in a couple of weeks and it was just mm. kind of like, I, I really need to do that. So I told her, I said, Hey, Friday, don't make any plans. We're going out. Good for you. And it was so good. It was really good. Cause then after that day, like Saturday came and I was just ready to go for work, for school. And like, she felt great and she did great at work. Like, so knowing that I have to put my relationship with my wife and I have to use that to reflect Christ's love for me, um, uh, in that way, He's given Jesus has given me peace to know that sometimes I can say no to some things mm. um, and say say yes to loving and serving my wife because that's what he's called me to do mostly in this in this world. All right, I got a story for you. Go ahead. So, I think it was last week. Mm-hmm. I was scheduled to go to Lee Paul's pre-record. Yeah. So he was doing his kind of they, they do a pre-record on Thursday, make sure the message is right, and yeah. uh, I was supposed to go to it. So I show up. It's one thirty. And auditorium's empty. There's nobody in, like, Sean Quinlivan's changing a light bulb, you know, like, I'm like, okay, I missed a memo or something. <laughs> and uh, I, I go upstairs to the office. They said, oh, Lee pushed it back to 3.30. Don't worry, it's still on. So I was frustrated. I'm like, what am I going to do for the next two hours, you know? Like, <laughs> I, I'm just like, I'm like, come on. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go to the Y. I'll get a quick run in, Could you know. Be, but I, I was just though. frustrated. And I think sure. it was, I could have went frisbee golfing. You're right. right but I really think what it came down to was I felt like my time yeah. was valuable and maybe like now it wasn't being valued as it should be. Mm-hmm. So on the way to the Y, I get a text message from Ed Bellner, who's our West Little Campus pastor. Mm-hmm. And the text message said, Heather has cancer, Heather being his daughter. And in that moment, I felt so stupid and convicted about how stupid my problems were. You know, here I'm mad because my time isn't being valued and, um, you know, I I don't, I'm not getting the notification I think that I should get so I can plan my life accordingly. Um, And uh, it it was just, it was a humbling moment where I realized, you know what, I am in a hurry for no good reason. Yeah. There are bigger things than what I am worried about in the moment. And having an extra two hours on my hands is probably the least of my worries. Right. So I, I just, at, at that moment, I just put the phone down and I just started praying. And I'm like, God, I need you to show up here. I, I need you to give me a new heart to heal Heather um, and to, uh, to just take over. That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. We're going to be moving on to uh, Nahum 1, 7 through 9. Nahum? Nahum. That's how I say it, man. Nahum? I say Nahum. Nahum? It flows off the tongue better. I think it's Nahum. Okay. You want to read Nahum? One, seven through nine? I'll read Nahum. Go ahead. Okay. Gonna Nahum, do- one, seven through nine. We're going to find out who's <laughs> correct in this, because there can only be one. That's Yeah, you're right. Except Maybe. for... Her- okay, never mind. Go ahead. Nope. All right. Nahum, one, seven through nine. Feels good to be right on that. <laughs> the Lord is good. A strong refuge when trouble comes, but he is close to those who trust in him. But he will sweep his enemies, who will sweep away his enemies in an overwhelming flood. He will pursue his foes into the darkness of the night. Why are you scheming against the Lord? He will destroy you with one blow. He won't need to strike twice. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's not, that's not good. Nope. You, you don't want to hear that the Lord is going <laughs> to destroy you with in one, one blow. blow. All right, here's our question. How does the knowledge that God sees everything, judges sinful people as guilty, and one day will right every wrong affect how you live your day-to-day life? Well, that's huge. Um, I think there's two parts to my answer. I'll go real quick. Uh, One, it means I don't need to hold guilt over other people because I'm not the judge, jury, and executioner. You you don't need to keep score constantly. I don't need to. Yeah, and so it it allows me to live in freedom in my day-to-day life, knowing that if somebody does something that makes me feel like they've wronged me, then I can I can forgive them in my heart and I can move on. The other side, too, is that my wrongs are going to be outed and, and, oh, and really? judged by God, whatever. So I, I know that I have to, um, I can't hide anything. I can confess things to people, and that's part of the freedom that we get as believers in Christ. 
Yeah, I, I just I love the fact that you know when I when I watch the news at times I'll get a little depressed mm-hmm. because there's just so much injustice, so much pain, so, so much that you wish you could change. Yeah, and to know you know what, God is in control. Right, you know evil is allowed to temporarily reign right now, but He is a, a much better judge than I am, and He will right every wrong. That's awesome, for sure. Cool. All right. Well, uh, I. I have a cool story I want to share, if I can. Can I, can I take like two minutes here? I'll and, allow it. All right. So I'm reading a book, Soul Keeping, by John Ortberg, which mm-hmm. is awesome. Yeah. And there's this cool interaction that he records. So if you have the book Soul Keeping, you're interested, it's page 109 through 111. My old boss from Chicago, Bill Hybels, was studying the Bible for a sermon in a restaurant one time. A young woman looked over and asked, why are you reading that? Bill looked back and said this exact quote, because I don't feel like going to hell when I die. (laughs) (laughs) He says, Bill has a little problem with expressing himself assertively sometimes. Mm -hmm. She retorted, there's no such thing as heaven and hell. Bill thought this is going to be interesting. He turned and said, why do you say that? She said, everybody knows that when you die, your candle goes out. Poof. You mean to tell me there's no afterlife? No. So that means you must be able to just live as you please. That's right. Like... There's no judgment day or anything like that? Right. Bill continued, well, that's fascinating to me. Where did you hear that? She said, I read it somewhere. Can you give me the name of the book? I don't recall. Can you give me the name of the author of the book? I forgot his name. Did the author write any other books? I don't know. Is it possible that the author changed his mind two years after he wrote this particular book and then wrote another one that said there is a heaven and a hell? Is that possible? It's possible, but not likely. So then Bill says, all right, let me get this straight. You are rolling the dice on your eternity predicated on someone you don't even know who wrote a book that you can't recall the title of. Have I got that straight? She looked back and said, that's right. Bill summarized, you know what I think, my friend? I think you have merely created a belief that guarantees the continuation of your unencumbered lifestyle. I think you made it up because it's very discomforting to think of a heaven. It's very discomforting to think of a hell. It's very unnerving to face a holy God in the day of reckoning. I think that you made it all up. And he says the conversation got a little edgy after that, yeah. which I'm sure you can imagine. Wow. As only Bill Hybels can yeah. do. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, when I think about people who just say, well, I don't believe in that. You know, I, I don't believe in heaven and hell or God or, right. you know, what they're really saying is I don't want to face my eternity. I don't want to face a time where I will have to have a reckoning for the good that I've done, the bad that I've done. And you can fool yourself into living that way and yeah. believing that way. But the truth is there is a God. There is a day of judgment. Um, even for Christ followers, even for right. people that, yeah. um, you know, have accepted Christ, their eternity is sealed, they are going to heaven, they still are going to have to give an account for everything that they have done, good and bad in their life. Right, and interestingly enough, like, that question of heaven and hell is not, it's not a um, um, an easy one, I guess, and it's not one that should be taken lightly, especially since for pretty much all of human history, there's been a discussion on heaven, hell, afterlife, and so for anybody to say, and I don't know her, but I'm just thinking generally, that I just don't believe in it. The question the question asks and maybe even begs for a better response than that. And if I can go real quick, just talk about this. When we were, I was back in California for a residency for my school, and we had a guy who came up who went to seminary as a Christian, left an atheist. Wow. And he told us his story. And my friend, uh, my professor... Um, he was there in class? He was there. My, oh my pr- professor, Sean McDowell, Josh McDowell's yeah, son, yeah, yeah. he's one of my professors, and this is the um, the case for the resurrection class, right? Wow. So he has this guy come in, his name is Dan Mages, and he was very nice, very cool guy, but he went into seminary Christian, came out um, an atheist, and he explained what happened. He talked about how he had a friend in seminary told him he didn't believe in the doctrine of hell anymore. He believed in more of like an annihilationist. Yep. So you just, it just ends. You, you can go to heaven to exist. or nothing, right? Right. So, and he said he spent the night in the library researching it and realized when he was done that there was no hell. And everybody, we were just listening and I sat there thinking, I was like, so you spent one night, one night, that's it. And you eliminate the doctrine of hell from your vocabulary and from your beliefs. It only took you one night. And then the, the progression happened after that. So if I can allow not that, then there's probably not heaven, but there might yeah, be a when, God. Well, when you stop taking scripture literally, and you can pick and choose the parts that you like, the parts yep. that you don't, Yep. then at that point, the gospel loses all validity. Exactly. And There's no point. 
Right. So the, the question of heaven or hell has to be taken more seriously than I think contemporary people take it. And they say, I don't really want to believe in hell, so I'm not going to. It doesn't matter what you want to believe. It matters what's true. Don't you think it always also speaks to, though, that there are some people that they just want to avoid any sort of pain? And oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. about heaven and hell, I mean, it's the same reason why, like, I haven't been to the doctor in, like, five years probably. Because, that's true? That's true, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Because, like, I just – and, like, my grandpa my grandpa's the same way. Like, he doesn't want to go see a doctor because if you go to the doctor, there could be something wrong with you, which wow. is stupid. Yeah. But it's like if I avoid it, I don't have to deal with it. Right. I'm going to check your blood pressure right after we get done taping, <laughs> Eric. <laughs> Do that. But you make a good point, though. Like, yeah, you just avoid the issue, and then it's not an issue for yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I know of people that, like, won't go into hospice centers, you know, won't go into hospitals – Dentist chairs, same thing. I, if I just avoid the pain, then it goes away. Anything unpleasant, I run away from it. Yep. I mean, it's that's that's what we're talking about right now. All right. Let me clarify, though. I'm not that way in my whole life. That's just, <laughs> just happened to be the example. <laughs> nobody's you judging you. Nobody's just judging want to make you, sure. But God. Go ahead. What's next? <laughs> Let's go to Kroger, and I'm going to stick your arm in that blood pressure machine. <laughs> Are those things accurate? Um, I feel uh, like they're not. Okay, well, anyways, that was a random question. Uh, Nahum 3, 1 through 4. This will be our last section that we check out today. What sorrow awaits Nineveh, the city of murder and lies? She is crammed with wealth and is never without victims. Hear the crack of whips, the rumble of wheels, horses' hooves pound, and chariots clatter wildly. See the flashing swords and glittering spears as the charioteers charge past. There are countless casualties, heaps of bodies, so many bodies that people stumble over them. All of this because Nineveh, the beautiful and faithless city, mistress of deadly charms, enticed the nations with her beauty. She taught them all her magic, enchanting people everywhere. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty... I told you Nahum was a good writer. Right. I mean, it, so in that, we see that Nineveh used, the city of Nineveh used um, the beauty, prestige, and power of that city to seduce other nations into their idolatry, their sin, their, their sinfulness. Yep. And like a, uh, for lack of a better term, I guess, a harlot, she re- she seduced the other nations into friendships and then made them do the things that, that she was doing. And you see that kind of with like, um, you think of Jezebel in the story with... Yep. Um, her, the Ahab. King, yeah, King Ahab, same kind of situation. Yep. All right. Here's our question. Have you ever let your guard down to a person, maybe a company or a group of people only to have your trust betrayed? What happened? You? you well, one? I got a story. Okay. So I, I worked at a place, which I won't mention, Bob Evans, that <laughs> was really tough to work at. Um, you know, if, if you've never worked yeah. at a food place or establishment you should just to aspire to something else in your sure. life so my boss there god love him he he it was like he had a little bit of power in his life because yeah. he was the manager and he was going to use it and he was going to get back at everybody that picked on him in high school <laughs> you know, every oh, wrong no. that had been committed to him that was his domain oh, no. and he was going to rule with an iron fist so I got hired on as carryout. They call me super carryout sure. boy. I was yeah. 18 at the time. It's awesome. Yep. So that's what I did. You know, the phone rings. I pick it up. I put together orders. I get it sent out for people. But yeah. sometimes you're just, you're slow. There's certain times of the day where not many people are doing carryout orders. So he would have me go back and do kitchen prep. And as time went on, he had me do this more and more and more. And when you're back doing kitchen prep, you know, a waitress, she'd take an order here, there, whatever, but I'm getting no tips if I'm in the back. And when I did right. carry out, you know, every third order would, would give me a tip. Right. And that, that's what I was hired to do. Right. So I just didn't like doing kitchen prep. So I went to my boss one day. I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm a team guy. I'm here to help, but I really got hired for carry out and I would really not like to do kitchen prep. Like, especially uh, one of the jobs that you had to do was bag fries. So they wanted to have like 3.5 ounces of fries exactly for yeah. an order of fries. So you would take a frozen box of fries, this huge thing, and then you would parse it out in a little 3.5 yeah. ounce bag. Sure. So I told him, I said, you know, like you had me doing fries for four hours yesterday and I just, it's just not what I want to do. And, you know, I'm willing once in a while, but could I like not do fries? That guy put me on fries for the next week, every single day, just because I said something about it, just to be a jerk. Wow. Yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. I got, (laughs) I mean, I worked for some food service places. I worked for one pizza company and my tips were being stolen. So I quit. 
Um, but I mean, I wasn't as, I guess it wasn't as a, I just like, I'm just going to quit. I don't care. So yeah, I, I, what burned me was, you know, I opened myself up. Like I made myself vulnerable, like, Hey, you know, could we work on this? (laughs) And he's like, nah, no, he smiled in my face. He's like, okay, sure. Thanks for letting me know. Appreciate it. And then bam, seven days in a row. Jeez. Well guys, we don't, uh, we don't have much time left today. Um, but we, there's so much we didn't cover in both books. So we'd love, like, again, we'd love for you guys to read through those. Um, and thanks so much. Well, here's the point we want you to land on today. There are consequences for your actions. Nobody goes through life without there being a ledger kept uh, mm-hmm. between them and God that one day you will have to account for everything that you have done, yeah. good and bad. So I would say that doesn't mean live in fear. God is a gracious God. He is loving. Uh, but you, you don't have to go through life trying to right every wrong that you see because God's got it covered. Right, for sure. Well, thanks for hanging out with us, guys. You can find us on Facebook, Luke Shortridge or Andy Rectimal, and we'll accept your friend request. We'd love to hear any feedback or suggestions that you might have for us. Cool. You can also share the link on our Facebook for the show. It helps other people find find it you can write a review for us on itunes we appreciate that a few people have been doing that which yeah. is super cool great. and then andy what are we checking out next time one of my favorite minor prophets my favorite minor prophet back awesome we'll see you then thanks see guys you.